small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is also one of the triggers for mm -hmm, rosacea. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of patients that you see with rosacea will have irritable bowel type symptoms or bloating type symptoms. Uh, and when you do some testing for that and you treat it, that oftentimes will clear up their, uh, their rosacea. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. That's pharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, a place for conversations that matter. And if you got skin problems, you should listen up because this conversation is going to matter to you, particularly something called rosacea, acne rosacea. It's a terrible skin condition. We'll talk about what it is, but if you have it, you know what I'm talking about, and it is miserable. And today we have with us none other than Dr. Todd Lapine, who's my colleague, a frequent guest here on the special episode of The Doctor's Pharmacy, the house call episode. He's a graduate of Dartmouth Medical School. He's board certified in internal medicine. We've worked together for decades now. It's almost heading on three decades. It's kind of scary. Holy cow, you don't look any different than the day I met you, so <laughs> functional medicine must be working. Uh, he is an incredible guy, and he teaches all over the world. Well, not so much anymore, but you know, virtually now. Virtually, <laughs> and and has uh, been uh, as part of the faculty of the Institute for Functional Medicine, uh, American College for Advancement of Medicine, Age Management Medicine, and many many other great great organizations. So, Todd, welcome back to the Doctor's Pharmacy. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so first of all, we're talking about this weird condition that some people have never heard of called acne rosacea. We're going to talk about what it is how traditional medicine deals with it, why that's all wrong, and how we approach it using functional medicine. So what is acne rosacea? Okay, well, that's acne rosacea is a chronic uh, inflammatory condition that adults get. It's also another name for it is adult acne. And uh, patients who have it will get uh, redness to the face, usually over the, uh, the cheeks and the nose, sometimes the chin. And it can also be pretty severe. You can get uh, telangiectasias, which are like little uh, blood vessels. You get so you get those like little get, like blood line, blood, blood, lines, blood vessel yeah. lines in your face. Va you vasodilation yeah. of, the, of, the, of the blood vessels, papules, pustules. So it looks like uh, adult acne is really what it is. And uh, interestingly, it's fairly common. About 10% of the population has it. Uh, it tends to be more common in people who have Celtic origins, so Irish, Scottish, uh, English. Which is interesting. I'll talk about that later. So I'm Jewish from the Middle East. I'm safe. Yeah, it might, it might be. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> it might be. It might be. Yeah, um, and uh, it's a lot of famous people have actually had this. Uh, Bill Clinton yeah. uh, is one. Uh, w. C. Fields mm -hmm. uh, and, and the big bulbous nose. That exactly. You get. That's so an extreme the, so the, version so, of it. Yeah. So one of the complications of rosacea is chronic inflammatory changes to the skin. So you can get what's called rhinophyma. Which is basically when you see a clown with a red nose, that's rhinophyma. Yeah, that, that's what a rhinophyma big is. Red nose, and it can be actually quite debilitating. I mean, when it gets really, really bad, you can uh, get this uh, distortion of the uh, facial features, especially over the yeah. nose. Yeah, yeah. So it's this really nasty kind of acne, uh, and uh, it's what's what triggers it. Do we know from a traditional medicine point of view? Well, I, there are a variety of different triggers. When people have rosacea, uh, things that can trigger it are spicy foods. Uh, alcohol can do it. Yeah, I mean, alcoholics tend to get this a lot, right? If you're an alcoholic, and, and WC feels clearly was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if those of you who don't know who he is, Google it. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably before your time, but it's, it, it, it is often driven by alcohol. Yeah, and I, 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 my own theory on alcohol as it ties in with that is that alcohol does vasodilate blood vessels, mm -hmm. uh, but also alcohol in excess is also a big contributor to leaky gut. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, you know, I get my patients to understand this uh, concept that alcohol can promote leaky gut. So if I took a shot of tequila and I threw it in your eye, what would happen? It would burn. It, your eye would water, right? Your yeah. eye would get leaky. You have leaky yeah. eye, leaky gut. So yeah. chronic alcohol ingestion is probably one of the biggest things for low-grade uh, endotoxin and uh, leaky gut. And that's also tied in, uh, as we'll talk about, uh, in terms of irritable bowel and Bacteria yeah, we're going to get into leaky gut because that yeah. is a, it's a very big issue in general and particularly with things like skin disorders like acne rosacea. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so Todd, um, you know, in functional medicine, we, we take a very different view, which is we treat things from the inside out, not the outside in, right? And dermatology right. is all about lotions, potions, and creams and slathering stuff on your face to sort of get it good from the outside in. But it's kind of it's kind of backwards. Yeah. So what what are the traditional treatments for rosacea? And why are they not the best idea? You know, when I went through my medical training, there was an old uh, saying that the dermatologist basically, if it's if it's dry, wet it. If it's wet, 
uh, dry moisturize it. it and if you don't know what's going on give it a steroid that's that's essentially that's pretty what, much right that's, yeah. that's pretty much dermatology that's, i learned that, the same lesson yeah and it, right that, that's 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 it and you know dermatology and if it's, there dry, are, there dry, are, if, it's if it's wet dry it if it's dry wet it and if you don't know give it a steroid <laughs> exactly that's 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 the, uh, the the mantra of the modern uh, uh dermatologist um but again it's like you said it's it's an it's an external manifestation of something going on internally uh so the question is is what's driving this mm. and uh in in preparing for this talk, I mean, I've, I've seen so many patients with rosacea. It's not funny. What, what, what do they put on there? They put, give antibiotics on uh, the face? They, yeah, yeah, they'll give like, give they, like uh, uh, you know, metronidazole cream, a, a, which a is topical a, uh, anti, uh, antibiotic. It's uh, like an anti-parasite antibiotic. Yeah, yeah what, one, of the newer, one of the newer medications, and this is sort of an interesting thing, is, is, a, is a cream called ivermectin. So this sort of blew me away because this is relatively new, and I think we were talking about it yeah, earlier. It's a worm pill. It's a it's a parasite. Uh, They're pill. using it for COVID, even really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so it's really it was it, so it said to my so I, I I was reading and I had actually had a patient who came in and was on the ivermectin cream and was doing very very well on the mm. ivermectin cream, mm. and then I, I said to myself, well, how is an anti parasitic medication topically helping with uh, you got words rosacea. in your face. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also that's also interesting because one of the things that uh, is strongly tied in with uh, uh, rosacea. Now, remember, rosacea is just over the face. It's it's this it's this facial manifestation of an internal uh, issue. Is that we have these little creepy crawlers on our face, and they're called uh, mites, skin mites. Yeah. Uh, a, a dermadex. Kind of like. Dust mites. But we all, we all have them. We, everybody has these. And the interesting thing is that patients who have rosacea have a much, much higher density of skin mites on them for whatever reason. And normally, they, they, they basically, they're like little, uh, you call them like little parasites. So they're ectoparasites. And they sit on the skin and they, they eat uh, your dead tissues and they, they eat, uh, eat off of the uh, oils on the, on the glands. And normally, you don't have a reaction to them. They're sort of like a benign parasite. But in some people who have high concentrations of these skin mites, the body m makes a very, very high uh, immune response to it. So uh, getting back to the ivermectin, which is basically an anti-parasitic, anti it may be actually working as an anti-parasitic for some of these skin mites. Yeah. So maybe yeah, there's that, an infectious cause to this. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, so, so what, the, the things they use are minocycline, which is an antibiotic, flagyl or metronidazole, which is an anti-parasite and an yep. antibiotic, ivermectin, which is an anti-worm pill. <laughs> oral, oral doxycycline is another one. Yeah. Oral antibiotics, which probably is a really bad idea given yeah, the fact yeah. that you have a microbiome and you don't want to be... Killing it to fix your skin. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And and why that? Why might that minocycline work? Why might antibiotics orally work? Well, it, it, there's a there's a thought, and there's actually it's actually in the literature is that uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is also one of the triggers for mm -hmm. rosacea. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of patients that you see with rosacea will have irritable bowel type symptoms or bloating type symptoms. Uh, and when you do some testing for that and you treat it, that oftentimes will clear up their uh, their rosacea. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think, I think, you know, we're not averse to using topicals and, and topical medication when necessary, but if you really focus on root causes, yeah. which is what functional medicine does, you come up with a very different set of approaches that right. actually works better, is longer lasting and doesn't require you to keep putting on lotions, potions, and creams for the rest of your life or taking oral antibiotics. Right. Exactly. And then the, getting back to the ivermectin, ivermectin, and, and, and I, uh, in preparing for this talk, I uh, did some little little bit of research, and the patients who are more prone towards uh, rosacea have a problem with too much of what's called uh, the cathelicide and antimicrobial peptide. So these well, that's are these a big mouthful. Yeah, they they called CAMP, C A M P, uh, cathelicide and antimicrobial peptides, and these peptides are part of the built-in innate part of the immune system to protect our skin against various types of infections. And it turns out that ivermectin actually uh, helps with these uh, these antimicrobial peptides because people who have rosacea have too much of these peptides. They have like an over uh, uh, robust response to uh, antimicrobials. So it's it's thought that the uh, one of the it's actually a breakdown product. It's called LL thirty seven, mm. and uh, ivermectin actually works on dampening down these uh, uh, antimicrobial peptides to decrease inflammation in the skin. Okay, so. Uh, in terms of in terms of the, the cause, it seems to be a combination of 
internal and external factors, right? Yeah, something's I, on the skin and then something's internally. But from traditional medicine, there really isn't an approach to helping heal the skin from the inside out. No, not at and, all. And whether you have acne or eczema or psoriasis or rosacea or any one of the myriad skin conditions that we get, most of them have their root cause inside, not on the topical level. Exactly. And, and, and often it's the gut. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you mentioned a little bit earlier leaky gut. So take us through from a functional medicine perspective, our thinking about the root causes. What are, what are the things that you think about when someone comes to your office and their face is all red and they got all this acne on there and they've got like all these teleinjectasia, these little red lines everywhere and you can see the blood vessels dilated and they're kind of looking like uh, Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they also get they also get photosensitivity too, which is yeah. the other the other thing. And the interesting means they thing, can't go in the sun without getting it worse. And and that that also ties in with these uh, antimicrobial peptides because uh, it's thought it's theorized that the 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 Celts, the the ones who live in the higher northern uh, 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 latitudes, they don't get as much sun as we do. So it's thought that from an evolutionary standpoint that they benefit by having this. They have a more robust immune system when there's not enough sunshine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and sunshine will actually activate this, this innate immune system. And that's why sun exposure oftentimes makes it worse because they produce more of these antimicrobial peptides. Mm. And then those antimicrobial peptides have to get processed. And in the process of uh, breaking them apart, the immune system then starts responding to it. So that's why there's a sort of a photosensitivity uh, aspect to it. And what are the other sort of things you think about when someone comes to your office with rosacea? Well, uh, one of the things I oftentimes look at is their vitamin D levels. Uh, vitamin D is 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 part of the uh, uh, immune system, and it's uh, it's tied in with uh, uh, intimately with the antimicrobial peptides uh, system in the body. So oftentimes, patients who have this have low vitamin D levels. Uh, we'll look at the uh, microbiome testing to see if there's any uh, evidence of dysbiosis, uh, bacterial overgrowth testing, the SIBO testing, checking for hydrogen and methane. Uh, I mean, probably the majority of patients who I see have rosacea have problems with, uh, with uh, bacterial overgrowth. Other thing is low stomach acid which also pr uh, promotes and contributes to bacterial overgrowth. Yeah. So checking for the patients, uh, sometimes these patients are also on PPIs. Uh, acid blocking Acid medication. blocking medications, yes. absolutely, yep. Yeah. Uh, because we have acid in our stomach to help us to digest food. It's also there to, to decrease uh, the amount of bacteria higher up in the colon. So uh, it's, good, it's good to have stomach acid. Yeah, because so if you don't have stomach acid, then the pH of your small intestine changes, becomes more alkaline, and then bugs grow in there that wouldn't necessarily grow. Yeah. And that's when you get this overgrowth of bad bugs in there. And it, it can be what we call SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, where bad bugs migrate up from the lower intestine into the small intestine. And then when you eat foods, you get bloating, distension. It causes leaky gut. You end up causing a damage to the lining of the gut and food particles and bacterial toxins leak in and create inflammation throughout the body and on the skin. So, you know, leaky gut can cause hundreds of different manifestations, one of which is rosacea. Yep. And unless you think about that and learn how to treat it, you may not be able to be successful with it. There's also another condition that I've seen, Todd, in, in a lot of my patients called CIFO. CIFO, well, small which, is, <laughs> small intestinal which fungal. is small intestinal fungal overgrowth. Yeah. And a lot of people talk about it as candida, but there's many, many species of, right. of yeast and fungus. And, and so what I found often is that treating the gut through addressing the bacterial overgrowth, the yeast overgrowth, healing leaky gut, dealing with the food sensitivities makes a profound impact. Yeah. And a lot of times it is food sensitivities that, that can trigger. I mean, for example, gluten, we've talked about on the show, that is one of the biggest drivers of leaky gut. Yeah. And even, even if you are not celiac, right. and even if you don't think you have any symptoms or don't notice any symptoms when you eat gluten, Dr. Alessio Fasano, who's the world's expert at Harvard on gluten, he said, Everybody who eats gluten creates some level of leaky gut. Right. Now, most people kind of handle it. Right, transient leaky gut, exactly. Yeah. So, I don't know, like, it, it's probably not a good idea to eat that much gluten because yeah. of the potential to create leaky gut and how that is linked to so many chronic diseases, including Absolutely. weight gain, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, yeah. autoimmune diseases, yeah. allergies, acne. I mean, you just name it, depression, all of this stuff is connected by, by leaky gut. So I really, I think, you know, getting a very different thinking about this is key. And you, you did, you talked about the stomach acid, you talked about the yeah. acid blockers, you talked about uh, maybe other things that, that, that you know, are, are relevant in the gut and fix it. Certain infections like H. pylori, which is a common bacteria yeah. that causes ulcers, also has been linked to H. pylori. 
and food sensitivities. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Hyman. Thanks for tuning into The Doctor's Pharmacy. I hope you're loving this podcast. It's one of my favorite things to do and introducing you all the experts that I know and I love and that I've learned so much from. And I wanna tell you about something else I'm doing, which is called Mark's Picks. It's my weekly newsletter. And in it, I share my favorite stuff from foods to supplements to gadgets to tools to enhance your health. It's all the cool stuff that I use and that my team uses to optimize and enhance our health. And I'd love you to sign up for the weekly newsletter. I'll only send it to you once a week on Fridays. Nothing else, I promise. And all you have to do is go to drhyman.com forward slash picks to sign up. That's drhyman.com forward slash picks, P-I-C-K-S, and sign up for the newsletter. And I'll share with you my favorite stuff that I use to enhance my health and get healthier and better and live younger longer. Now back to this week's episode. So how do, how do we approach these patients when they come in? What are the kinds of things that we would do from a diagnostic point of view that you wouldn't get when you went to the dermatologist? Well, from a diagnostic standpoint, uh, again, I would do testing for um, you know uh, leaky gut. I would do intestinal permeability testing, checking for antibodies to uh, zonulin uh, with the Cyrex testing that we do, Cyrex uh, array number three. So, so that's basically, there's a test that we do at the center for uh, the Ultra Wellness Center here in, in Lenox, Massachusetts, where we're recording live, <laughs> is uh, Cyrex testing. It's a lab that looks at antibodies that you produce against these proteins that are in your gut that come from gluten or even from bacteria. And yeah. so if you're an, you're creating a lot of antibodies to these proteins, it's clear that they're getting across the lining of your gut, yeah. leaking into your bloodstream and causing an immune response, which is not only local, but systemic. Right. And and I and there are you're, there are other ways. You can actually measure zonulin in the blood and you can measure it also in the stool. And that's only like a snapshot in time. So you can develop leaky gut for, you know, a couple hours or a day or so. But if it if it stops, then you're all so fine. The antibodies against zonulin is the one that tells you that there's this chronic leaky gut, which is really more valuable. Because mm -hmm. if I gave you a shot of tequila, then, you know, an hour later, measure your zonulin, it's going to go up. Okay, where's the tequila? Yeah, that sounds exactly. good. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so that's why I think that the uh, the, the testing for the antibodies against uh, zonulin is, is e even more valuable in these uh, patients with chronic conditions. Uh, and what other kinds of tests besides the the uh, the zonulin and the lipopolysaccharide tests that we do to look at the antibodies well, against these proteins in the gut that come from a leaky gut? We'll do the uh, the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth where we'll measure the production of fermentation products. So hydrogen and methane are gases that are normally produced in the body. Um, uh, when people have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, those would be uh, produced at higher levels. So we can check that. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, or I think we, or the test that we do is a three hour test. So you measure baseline hydrogen methane, check it at uh, uh, intervals of about every half hour. And you do that over a three hour time period. And that can tell you definitively, do you or do you not have uh, bacterial overgrowth and how bad is it? And is it predominantly hydrogen or is it methane? So, so essentially, essentially what you're saying is that, is that when we eat foods, you know, humans don't produce gas. It's the bacteria that are fermenting the foods we eat that produce the gas. So if Absolutely. you feel bloated or distended or you're passing gas, it's not you. You can blame it on the bugs. <laughs> but but the problem is that we don't know how to regulate the bugs, bugs and get a healthier ecosystem. And that, right. and that is what, what most physicians never were trained to do. Yeah. And it's the foundation of functional medicine. It's the foundation of our practice here at the Ultra Wellness Center where we really dig into these issues and we look at bacterial overgrowth. We look at fungal overgrowth. We look at a leaky gut. We look at food sensitivities. We'll do other testing to look at whether you're reacting to gluten or dairy or eggs or other foods. And and it's really helpful in, in drilling down on what's really going on with people. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that, you know, we're talking basically producing gases. That's basically a fermentation process. And normally fermentation happens lower in the colon. That's in the in the colonic area. The ant with the, it was more of an uh uh, uh, what's an anaerobic environment or a lack of oxygen. And mm -hmm. that's normal for that to be happening. But when that process is taking place higher up in a different neighborhood, it's not a good thing. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, you want your upper intestine to be sterile and... <laughs> or mostly sterile. <laughs> mostly sterile. And when it, and all that bacteria migrates up there, it's just a bad situation. And when we take acid blockers, when we you know are low in magnesium which half us are when we're under stress and our gut motility is slow when we uh you know have taken lots of antibiotics and it screws up our whole system oh, yeah. in there you know all these are reasons why we get these bacterial overgrowth issues and they're super common and, and they're easy relatively easy to treat with functional medicine now the other thing we do is look at stool testing right so yep. we, we look at not just the the uh, proteins from leaky gut or we look at the food sensitivities or bacterial overgrowth gas production but we actually look at the poop 
Yeah. So what are we what are we looking for in the poop that helps us figure out what's going on? Well, there's a lot of things. Uh, you know, there's gold in there. Uh, there, it really is. It's uh, it's gold in the hills. It's gold in them there are hills. Yeah. So the, a, a lot of uh, information can be uh, uh, determined by doing a, a microbial analysis. So you can look at the overall balance of bacteria. So there are you know everybody's got hundreds of different kinds of bacteria in the in the GI tract. And we can measure those using DNA uh, PCR uh, uh, analysis, and do, we can do quantitative. We can measure how many uh, there are of each different species. Look at ones that are normally found. Look at ones that are found in the gut, but normally they want to be at low levels. Uh, look at bacteria that are uh, tr associated with autoimmunity, so things like Citrobacter, Klebsiella, Salmonella, yeah. uh, et cetera. Uh, we can look at now analyze uh, for uh, yeast overgrowth, yeah. various uh, forms of yeast, um, and then also microbial uh, markers of inflammation, things like calprotectin, yeah. looking for fat. So you can get enzyme a enzyme function, exact enzyme function, uh, butyrate, uh, checking for butyrate, short chain, fats, short chain fatty acids, indicators of healthy ecosystems. So you know, Todd, what you're what you're saying is that you know traditional sort of microbiome testing, they just look at the the, the oh. genetic material of the the microbiome and they can't really test everything although they can do some really ex extraordinary tests now but there are, there are kits out there where you can look at your microbiome but it, it, it's far more than just what bugs you have in there it's yeah. what they're doing yeah, and they're so we look at the 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 result the function on the ecosystem we look like you said at the enzyme function are you absorbing your food is there inflammation yeah. are, are you having good bugs in there that are producing the the super fuel for the gut these short chain fatty acids that are so important oh huge or do you have the right balance of gut are you missing some key bugs you have overgrowth of bad bugs you have yeast you have parasites and it's such a much more comprehensive stool test that we do here at the ultra wellness center we were talking earlier about uh, delta sleep and the interesting thing is is that when you have good bugs in the in the digestive tract and the and you're eating enough fiber in your diet and you're producing higher levels of butyrate that has an effect on the brain and mm. also improves uh, uh sleep that's amazing yeah yeah so you have to have your get your poop together to sleep better <laughs> i got it okay that's that's, it. It's, that's a good good strategy it's better yeah. than taking uh, ambient yeah um all right so we also look at uh you know other things like omega-3 fats and and other fats because yeah. a lot of uh inflammation can come from not having the right balance of fats in absolutely your, in your body yep yeah um and, and and I think you know so so when you have a patient come in what what are the what are the steps you would take initially to to treat a patient with rosacea from a functional medicine perspective you know the, again taking the history is the big one you know um I, I always will ask people what's your ethnic background a lot of people say you know I'm white you know it's, it's like you know are you Irish English German Jewish Russian whatever because mm -hmm. the uh, rosacea is typically found in in light skin fair skin people and from a genetic standpoint they are the ones who are more likely to have that it's just an interesting part to know uh, to have in terms of the history and then uh, i'll just uh, ask them you know what is it you're eating are you eating a standard american diet uh how much alcohol are you drinking um how much stress do you have stress caffeine. also uh, caffeine can, yeah caffeine can play a role Spicy foods can trigger. yeah those are those are all things which can sort of you know it's like adding gasoline to the fire uh because literally rosacea is the skin on fire in the in the mm -hmm. in the in the uh in the facial area but um, doing the testing for essential fatty acids, making sure that um, uh, they have the right balance of the essential fats in their diet. A lot of people uh, are uh, have too much omega-6, which tends to be more pro-inflammatory, yeah. a lack of the omega-3s. Uh, um, one of the uh, oils, I don't know if you've used it, uh, that, I, that I found yeah. it very helpful with um, patients who have rosacea is uh, uh, borage oil and even yeah. primrose oil. Yeah, they tend to be very. They help to dampen down that inflammatory response. And that's, that's a very key omega six that people don't think about much, but it's called gamma linolenic acid, which yep. is a very powerful anti-inflammatory. Yep. It's not like the omega threes, but it's sort of like the omega threes, but on the omega six side. Exactly. And it, and it, it's something we really have a hard time getting in our diet. It's from like borage oil and you know a few other things, but yeah, yep. evening primrose oil. Yep. So yeah, that's very powerful. I agree. And I also think that you know. Um, when I see these patients, I also think about looking for other clues, like do they have yeast issues? Have they been in lots of antibiotics? Are they on acid blockers, which cause yeast overgrowth? Yeah. Do they have other fungal issues? Do they have dandruff? Do they have anal itching? Do they have thrush or white coating in their tongue? Uh, you know, do they have vaginal yeast infections? Yep. Uh, do they have other skin markers of, of yeast, like little tinea or other kinds of things? So you'll see often a pattern of other issues yeah. around fungal stuff. Yeah. I'll check for H. pylori. I'll check again all the tests we we did talk about, and and see what's really going on. And then and then you know from the treatment point of view, 
um, you know, you start with an elimination diet with an anti-inflammatory diet, yep. right? Exactly. Yeah. Put it, putting patients on an anti-inflammatory elimination diet, you know, 80% of the time, doesn't matter what they come in with. They're going to actually, correct. they'll actually get better. They, they, you know, getting them off of the uh, pro-inflammatory foods uh, and then putting in foods which are uh, anti-inflammatory, uh, cold water fish, uh, sardines, wild salmon, um, uh, the essential oils like uh, uh, evening primrose oil help to sort of dampen down that uh, inflammatory response. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, we don't understand most of us how powerful food is as medicine and how it can drive tremendous amounts of inflammation throughout the body. And, you know, obviously if it's on your skin, it's visible, but there's also invisible inflammation that you're not seeing that's driving all the chronic diseases. And, and, yeah, and is that you actually you just you just you triggered a thought because there's actually a paper that says if you have rosacea you have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Oh wow! So it's not okay. just a, it's not just a you know a cosmetic issue. It's actually systemic. So you have a red face and a red brain that's on fire. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Is that yeah? That, that's I I'm I sort of blown away by that. That's it's, fascinating. Yeah, especially in women, it's actually more mm -hmm. more common in women. So so you you know you advise people the obvious things: cut out the alcohol, the caffeine, stay away from the sun, stay away from spicy foods. We also Tell them stay away from gluten, which triggers leaky gut, mm -hmm. often dairy. You, you, you actually add in all the anti-inflammatory foods that, that are important, the, all the phytochemicals from plant foods and turmeric and ginger and garlic yep. and rosemary and all these powerful foods that can really help to reduce inflammation. And, and then we often directly treat the issues that are going on. It could be leaky gut. Yep. So we, we give them a gut repair program. This could be fungal or bacterial overgrowth. So we'll we'll take care of those with either herbs or antibiotics or any fungals. Mm -hmm. And you'll see these patients really dramatically improve when they change their diet and they resort their gut. And then sometimes we'll use like things like even primrose oil. I found that digestive enzymes yeah. and hydrochloric acid absolutely often are really helpful too. Very, yeah, very, I, I've been so I've been surprised at how many people have a what I would call a relative uh, lack of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Uh, I, I was I venture to say that, you know, the majority of people don't have too much acid. They have a, not enough acid in the stomach. Yeah, well, that's interesting because the third leading uh, category of drugs are the acid blockers <laughs> like Prilosec and Prevacid and Pepsi, Pepsi and all these other yep. drugs, these uh, yeah. Nexium, Mass Effects. I mean, they're just like out there everywhere. <laughs> and now they're now they're over the counter and anybody. Yeah, exactly. Can, yeah. I mean, I, I just I, we've talked about this before on the podcast, but when I was in medical school, the drug reps came in because these drugs had just come out and they're like, listen, guys, these guys, these drugs work. They're, they're great. Uh, they will help people with ulcers if they're really bad. You do, don't want to keep anybody on it for more than six weeks. Right. That's a huge. It's it was a bit, that big red, stomach yeah. acid. It's really bad long term. These are the drug reps telling us this. And now it's like people are on it for decades and it causes B12 deficiency, magnesium deficiency, zinc uh, deficiency, osteoporosis. osteoporosis, pneumonia, bacterial overgrowth, irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah. When you get rid of your heartburn, but you get all these other problems. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, that's that's. And then, a, you, and then and then it's one of those drugs. It's so it's so sneaky because it's addictive. Yeah. Once you get on it, it's hard to get off it because it, it causes this rebound. So absolutely, when yeah. you suppress the stomach acid and you stop the drug, the acid production goes crazy. Exactly, which makes you feel horrible. And then you go, I need the drug, but you can actually taper it down and use other strategies to help people get off it. And you bring you bring up a really good point because a lot of the the pharmaceutical medications, especially some of the psychotropics, so the antidepressants are like that too. Uh, the the PPIs on the antidepressants, when you try to get off of them, you get this rebound process. So the body tries to get back into balance. And it's, it can be very difficult. So you've got to go low and slow when you're trying to taper off the PPIs or taper mm -hmm. off uh, antidepressant uh, psychotropic meds. Absolutely. Amazing. So so what what cases have you recalled about rosacea that you want to share that you know, give you a sense of yeah, this? Yeah. I, I, well, I, I had a patient who came, uh, came in and um, she was a undiagnosed celiac, not just a gluten sensitivity. She was an un undiagnosed uh, mm. celiac. Um, she was Irish and she was having a standard American diet. And uh, she was um, self-medicating for her um, heartburn with uh, uh, over-the-counter uh, acid-blocking medications. It had a lot of uh, bloating-type symptoms, mm. and uh, came in. Uh, and you know, her her major complaint was her skin. But you know, she had all these other things. But her big thing was, you know, it's how I look. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, people are vain and that people gets people's attention. Exactly. Right. And, and then when I uh, did a dive into uh, her uh, testing, you know, it turned out that she was deficient in her essential fatty acids, especially the gamma linoleic ah. acid. 
Um, she, she had a uh, lack of stomach acid because of the uh, PPIs. You can actually measure a test, uh, blood test is a commercially available test called gastrin. And ah. uh, gastrin levels will go up when you block acid. Um, so, um, and, and that's actually I, one of the tests that I actually like to use when I have patients where I'm trying to get them off of a PPI because the higher the gastrin level, the more difficult it will be to get off the PPI. Mm. Uh, and that's sort of like a little tell you how easy uh, you can These get off of it. These acid blockers, that's Exa the PPI, right? Exactly. And then uh, she also had uh, low vitamin D levels. I mean, we, you know, we spend a lot of our time clothed and indoors, so we don't get enough, way enough sun, uh, enough sunshine. Uh, that's mm. a, that's a, one of the big things. And low vitamin D, you don't just fix low vitamin D. This is one of my, I get up on my soapbox all the time with here, is you don't just fix low vitamin D by taking vitamin D. Yeah. Uh, vitamin D deficiency Why is not? basically a sunshine deficiency. Ah. There are certain uh, times when there can be other causes, like you might have fat malabsorption uh, that can cause low vitamin D, or you may have problems with the synthesis because of uh, lack of uh, uh, skin oils, which mm. um, when you get exposed to the sun, but by and large, uh, low vitamin D levels is related to sunshine deficiency. And it's it's that, you know, low vitamin D is not the problem. It's a symptom of another problem. Yeah. And the immune system is also benefited by sunshine exposure, healthy sunshine. Uh, I think you said you're going to be, you enjoy going to the uh, the tropics now and then, yeah. Caribbean, Hawaii, whatever. And we, we also feel good. It's also, I, this is another thing that I find fascinating is that there is a, uh, uh, a, a condition which is called sunshine addiction. You know, these people who are like suntan addicts? Well, it turns out that our bodies actually produce um, uh, endorphins when we are exposed to the sun. So there's a feedback mechanism. That's incredible. Uh, it's, oh yeah, yeah. It's it's there's a it's a there's a compound. It's called uh, pro opio melanocorticotropin hormone, and what it means is that our bodies give a reward when we're in the sun. So we feel good. We have these feel good molecules, these endorphins uh, that make us want to get the sun. Oh, that's interesting. That's why I love going in the sun. <laughs> exactly. No, and, and, and there are these people who- I have, always feel so good when I go to the beach in the summer. It just makes me so happy. Exa exactly. And, and and the interesting is it's, it actually, you can get addicted to the sun. And, and that's like, that's, it's like you can get addicted to food. I mean, your body needs food to survive and your body actually needs sunshine to survive. So our nature has built in these feedback mechanisms so that it we encourages us to do it. That's incredible. Yeah, isn't that wild? And so what happened with this patient? Uh, what did you do for her? Well, I <laughs> did a lot. I mean, uh, I had her work with uh, our nutritionist and got her off of her standard American diet. Uh, I uh, treated her uh, bacterial overgrowth. She had a significant uh, SIBO test. Um, so I treated that primarily with herbs. Um, a lot of uh, people will tr use antibiotics, things like rifaximin or zyfaxim for SIBO. I actually find that I do just as well using uh, antimicrobial herb uh, preparations. Um, I supported her stomach acid uh, using betaine HCL. Uh, some patients don't respond to that. They, they, they don't tolerate it as well. So sometimes I'll use things like apple cider vinegar. Mm. Um, and then uh, got her uh, fatty acids up, gave her a little bit of uh, 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 borage oil and um, you know a combination of that. And then also just told her to get some healthy sunshine. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, know, you need to go out and sunbathe or go to a sun tanning booth, but just getting healthy sunshine uh, can uh, help with um, um, down-regulating the immune system. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, you know, just off topic, but with COVID, there are some really interesting studies that giving high dose vitamin D helps with uh, COVID infections. Absolutely. And and so COVID it actually, or vitamin D, uh, when it's uh, at high enough levels, actually helps to keep the immune system in balance. It keeps it from getting over. Yeah, it, it controls over. hundreds of genes that regulate oh, immunity and inflammation. It's pretty amazing. It's not really a vitamin, it's more like a hormone. Exactly, exactly. It's like a hormone. And it's also, it actually likes to, acts like a steroid too. It's yeah. it's, a, it's a cholesterol molecule moiety. And uh, um, I oftentimes, when, if I'm gonna come down with a cold or a flu, I'll up my dose of oh, vitamin yeah, D, especially too. in the winter, absolutely. It's true, and I, when I feel like something's coming on, and I take like 50,000 units for three or four days and yeah. I never I never get sick. Yeah, it Literally can, goes away by the next morning. It is, it's pretty powerful. So, so Todd, we've just covered a lot here. And I, I, re I recall a lot of cases of mine that have had rosacea. And it's always one of those things where I love seeing because <laughs> it's so easy to treat and people suffer so much from it. Yep. And just by following the functional medicine approach, looking at the root causes, treating the skin from the inside out, 
addressing the gut, addressing food sensitivities, addressing nutritional deficiencies, which is really the foundations of functional medicine, these people get better. And we, yeah. we don't just take it at face value, yeah. good, <laughs> pun intended, good pun, pun good intended pun. but we, we actually go under the hood and look at what's going on. Exactly. You know, I, I think uh, there was one uh, great quote I, I heard somewhere that tr traditional medicine is like uh, trying to diagnose uh, what's wrong with your car by listening to the noises it makes instead of looking under the hood. Exactly. And functional medicine is about looking under the hood. Absolutely. And, and here at the Ultra Wellness Center in Lenox, Massachusetts, we've been doing this for decades. We have the most incredible team here who collectively have probably 70 years of clinical experience in functional medicine. And we're doing most of our care virtually now. So wherever you live in the world, we can take care of you using virtual Zoom consults. And uh, it's pretty gratifying to see how many people are taking advantage of that and getting better. Uh, and and uh, I think that uh, you know, this, is a, this is a challenging moment for everybody. And I think we, we often neglect our own health and our own health care. Uh, nobody wants to go to the doctor. Nobody wants to go to the hospital anymore. But, but I think you know people can get virtual care now, which is super yeah. awesome. Yeah. And uh, and we invite you to check it out. You go to yeah. ultrawellnesscenter.com. Uh, if you're suffering from any skin disorder, whether it's acne or acne rosacea or eczema or psoriasis, we've had some podcasts on that. Go listen to them. But this is really uh, an approach that works for skin disorders. I yeah. love skin problems yeah. because they are so easy to treat, whether, like I said, it's eczema, acne, rosacea, whatever it is, yeah. it's, it's pretty striking. And, and it's just heartbreaking to see how uh, many patients struggle with these conditions because they're often so uh, embarrassing. And that's yeah. one thing if you have you know, bacterial overgrowth and bloating, you're the only one who knows your stomach's bloated, yeah. right? But if you've got this nasty looking face or skin issues, you don't want to be seen like that. And I think this is it affects people's a sense of well-being and their self-worth and, and and i just want people to know there is really uh, clear approaches that help this yeah better. and the, the exciting thing is 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 it's a lot of the conferences that i go to there are now functional medicine dermatologists yes. who get it you yes. know because most dermatologists do not re realize or remember that the skin and the gut are contiguous they're connected so when you have a skin problem, it's oftentimes an internal problem. Yeah. And the functional medicine dermatologists, which are um, you know growing, um, are getting that. And they're, it's, they're it's really a, helping yeah, people. I agree. It is one of the most exciting parts of functional medicine is dermatology because it's like, <laughs> Yeah. It's like, oh, it's such a slam dunk. Yeah. And and uh, there are a number of really great functional medicine doctors out yeah. there who are dermatologists. Yeah. And and uh, you know, the stories are amazing. I just I just uh uh, you know, see so many people suffer unnecessarily. Unnecessarily, exactly. Yeah. So if you've been loving this podcast and you know someone with a skin problem or you've got a skin problem, come see us here. Share it with your friends and family on social media. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear how you've addressed your skin issues, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Uh, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy. Pharmacy.